to find the great PG. And so the stones were loaded. Cinema World Television premiere. Everyone has secrets. But keeping them is the hard part. Penelope Cruz. In her Academy Award nominated performance. Volver. Saturday at 10. go to the darker side and the lighter side uh, in, a, in less than five months. No? Call it. Javier Bardem goes from bad to good. Lucid dementia means you are clearly crazy. One of the oldest stories goes Hollywood. I will kill your monster. Do I have to move like him? It's not good me moving about like a, a 50-year-old fat boy, you know. It's all I saw were women and children running away from gunfire. Bill Donahue is talking again, and this time it's war. Sit down. This is America. Don't waste your right to speak. We're going to show the DGA! And hey, hey, ho, ho, the Writers Guild shuts down Tinseltown. Here's persuasion. Plus, what's new on DVD? And gay. 
All this and more on Stars, The Hollywood Reporter. The Writers Guild of America has officially called strike, and film and TV productions are already feeling the pressure. The Hollywood Reporter takes a look inside the strike and the effects on the entertainment industry. Hollywood writers went on strike as of 12.01 November 5th, and now we have a situation where on both coasts there's picket lines set up day by day, pretty much nine to five, uh, throughout Los Angeles and at select sites in New York. The disagreement ultimately is largely about two matters. How to compensate the writers when their content is used on DVDs or over the internet and other new media platforms. The DVD residuals that the writers get are paid out under a formula that was crafted in 1985. and. Pretty much ever since, the writers have complained about it. The writers believe that it was never a fair formula, and at each negotiation, that's brought up in a very strenuous way. That standoff is complicated this time by the additional fight over how to pay the writers when their work is used in internet streamed programming and also uh, e even the notion of downloads. The writers are paid under the hated DVD formula when there's downloads. And when it's an ad-supported situation, such as the streaming of TV shows or movies for free, this is something for which the writers get no additional pay. And it's become a very emotional standoff between the writers and the studios. Good news, ladies and gentlemen. We have Marketing is already severely impacted because of the loss of the late-night talk shows. Already, we've seen some go into reruns. Additionally, there's been almost an immediate halt in production of additional episodes for sitcoms and some other hit programs, but there was a stockpiling of scripts so that they could do a little more filming of on both the TV and the film side. Now, on the movie side, productions are still very much going before the cameras, and they're doing so inconvenienced by the fact that the writers are not there on the set to do any scene rewrites that might be necessary. So they're lurching forward, but there could be some problems. The parties are very entrenched in their positions, and though there could be some sort of back-channel efforts to get the negotiations back on track, for now, there's not a lot of optimism that it will be a short-lived strike. Beowulf takes another stab at the big screen. Javier Bardem gets lovesick. And a crusade against Santa's spending habits. New in theater. Such a strong man you are, with the strength of a king. What do you know of me? Hell hath no fury like a woman's scorn, as Angelina Jolie sets out to make a village feel her wrath in Robert Zemeckis' Beowulf. Who are you? I am Beowulf. The film uses Zemeckis' revolutionary 3D effects he used on Polar Express. We got it. Hey, we got it! I just wore this funny kind of wetsuit, and they shoved all these beads and pearls and buttons all over me. She's no hag, Beowulf. We both know that. And basically, you're wearing a, a full-body leotard with dots on it, and the dots are the, the, the capture the motion. And then, of course, you are scanned every time uh, you do a scene. Before you do a scene, you're scanned, and you do what is called a T-pose, so you put your, ha your arms out like this, and you, you do these extraordinary grimaces before you actually do a scene. And it was hilarious to see, you know, to see Anthony Hopkins and John Malkovich, these amazing actors going through, like, doing the most ridiculous grimaces. But you do that, actually, for the computer to scan your face and, and be able to, to, to replicate, you know, whatever motion you have in. Answer me. Did you kill? Portraying a character written more than 1,000 years ago made Ray Weinstone think hard about his character. Would I have been able to escape her had I not? I had to have some ideas about the size and the bulk of him, you know, because I had to move like him. 
It's no good me moving about like a, a 50 year old fat boy, you know. I, really, I, I had to move about like a man who was six foot six with an eight pack, who was a warrior. So I had an idea, but I had no idea how it was going to look, you know, not the, the finished article. I mean, it just blew me away, you know. My glamour! Over the years, my love remained constant. Is she married? Yes, but I'm waiting for her husband tonight. You're crazy. Director Mike Newell brings Nobel Prize winning author Gabriel Garcia Marquez acclaimed novel Love in the Time of Cholera to the big screen. I write this very short note to let you know that I love you. I think of you every moment. Our love will triumph. Uh, I found when I first read the book and when I then reread the book for the movie, I found that it told me all sorts of things that were. Uh, human truths that I, I belie believed in in my head, but I also very strongly felt in my heart. And I could, for instance, see my parents' marriage in chunks of this, um, of this book. And the biggest challenge, actually, was getting to that sensibility. We are man and wife. I want you to love every, every moment of our honeymoon. We tried to use the book as a kind of blueprint for every scene and every frame so that there would be, in any shot, there would be a little bit of the, of the book, which, of course, at the end of a film of, I don't know, 2,500, 3,000 shots, that starts to add up. I write poetry, too. I enter a poem every year in the Poetic Festival. Actor Javier Bardem plays a jilted lover consumed with emotion. The role is diametrically opposed to his recent role as a ruthless killer in No Country for Old Men. You know what date is on this coin? No. 1958. I mean, it's the first time in my life, and I've been working almost 20 years, when I choose to do something like that back to back because I always refuse to that. But there were two reasons why. One, because I like both uh projects and also because i want to put myself in a place where you have to go to the darker side and the lighter side for you to stretch the the muscles no? lucid dementia means you are clearly crazy with actors cast from all over the world getting a consistent accent for the picture wasn't an easy task your father said he'll keep you here for a year at least a year is nothing we will exchange telegrams as we used to exchange letters that was really strange because everybody is from a different country. No, like Benjamin and John are American, but Javier is Spanish, I'm Italian, Catalina is Colombian. And we had to speak all the same. But we had a lot of time before the start of the shooting to work with a dial of coach on that. And we worked really hard. <laughs> it was basically study. We workshopped for about three weeks before we began filming uh, and even worked with a movement coach to, to get the carriage and the sort of inbred sense of privilege and station that comes with being uh, uh, someone who comes from a good family. The important thing in marriage is not happiness, but stability. It's a pretty heavily concentrated thing to do to, to kind of stick with it and then make it second hand as you're actually doing the acting, which is the important stuff, but a lot of fun. You got Ben from San Francisco, I'm from New York. So we had a lot of coaching. It, 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 you know, Mike Newell is the only guy who can actually do this. He's done the period, he's done the drama, the comedy, the romantic comedy. And this novel is so complex, you got to have somebody who understands all those elements and can bring them together. Who is he? He said nobody. John Leguizamo shared what he learned by playing an overbearing father. Now, you have to be clever. Now, you can't be, you know, just a hard-ass dad. You can't do that because they'll run away. But, you know, nowadays you have to be clever. You have to do reverse psychology. Oh, that's great. Marry the broke loser. That's fantastic. And then try to sabotage that relationship somehow on, on the slide, on the DL. Crown goddess, I make this vow. I swear to you my eternal fidelity and everlasting love. And I ask you in all humility to do me the great honor of marrying me. The new documentary, What Would Jesus Buy?, examines the commercialism of Christmas with Reverend Billy and the Stop Shopping Choir, leading a crusade against America's gluttonous consumerism. Oh, we're going to go out across the shopping-addicted country. About 10 years ago, in Times Square, New York City, the Great White Way, I was, I was living nearby, 
and I saw the big box stores coming in and everything was changing. My neighborhood was changing. And I, I just asked myself, who's really shouting about what's happening in our lives here in Times Square? And I thought it was the sidewalk preachers were the people that still had a, a loud voice. So with my white coat, I got a collar in a religious supply store and I started preaching myself in front of the Disney store, which is kind of a Mickey Mouse was the Antichrist in my new religion. Mickey Mouse is the Antichrist! <laughs> Change the Louis. Change Alleluia. Change Alleluia. Do you think you have too many toys? Yes. Well, how did that happen? Because you and Mommy gave them to me and Christmas. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think that Billy says in the movie, and he says it towards the beginning, you don't have to buy a gift to give a gift. You know, we have been so swept up in this idea of consumerism and this whole, like, corporate, the whole corporatization of Christmas that without stuff, do we really have Christmas? And, uh, and I think there is this idea behind the holiday, and not just the holiday, our lives become so centered around things. Mm -hmm. The more things you have, the better you are, the better you feel, the more important you are. And I think if we can start to break that chain, you know, break that idea, an incredible transformation will happen. I think I'm gonna have to go supersize. Supersize Me's Oscar-nominated Morgan Spurlock produces the film. You know, for me, it's to try and pick films that I really believe you know, that, a, that I'm passionate about, and B, that I th think have some sort of a social relevance, you know, the films that we physically produce. You know, hopefully we can make films that will make people think, or make people laugh, but at the same time has an important message. And I think that if we can continue to put out movies like that, then, uh, then we'll be doing a good thing. Join us and many other Americans in saving Christmas from the apocalypse. Here's this week's rundown of the top five movies in the USA. The enemy is getting stronger. The enemy is getting uglier. Mr. Claus, welcome to the North Pole. Allergies. No black man has accomplished what the American Mafia had in a hundred years. You're talking to humans. You're flying outside the hive. <laughs> Jennifer Connelly befriends Keanu Reeves. Jessica Biel gets nailed. And Cyclops gets trapped in a box. All on this week's Hollywood Headlines. Jennifer Connelly is going to be starring opposite Keanu Reeves in The Day the Earth Stood Still, which Scott Derrickson is directing for 20th Century Fox. The remake of the uh, 1951 classic sci-fi movie, and uh, Keanu Reeves is playing Klaatu, the alien that comes to Earth and says, we must live in peace or we will all die. And Connelly is playing a scientist that kind of befriends the alien. Jake Gyllenhaal and Jessica Biel are teaming up together to star in a movie called Nailed, which is being directed by David O. Russell and written by Kristen Gore, who's the daughter of Al Gore. Beal is going to be playing sort of a sort of uptight, shy woman from a small town who accidentally gets a nail stuck into her head by a workman. And what this does is kind of actually unleash a lot of like sexual desire in her, and she ends up going to Washington to Congress to try and fight this, you know, in Washington, D.C. And there she meets an immoral politician who would be played by Gyllenhaal, and to sort of take advantage of her, you know, exciting sex drive and uh, her, you know, tries to take advantage of her political uh, rising status. James Marsden, who, you know, is best known for playing Cyclops in the X-Men movies, he was also in uh, Brian Singer's Superman Returns movie, is in final negotiations to star opposite Cameron Diaz in The Box, Richard Kelly's new sci-fi thriller, based on the Richard Matheson short story, where this couple can receive this box, they'll receive a lot of money if they press a button in the box, and of course when they press the button, someone that they don't know will die, and it's, it becomes a big uh, moral quandary. Here's a look at this week's worldwide box office numbers. You're just gonna have to close your eyes and jump. The enemy is getting stronger, the enemy is getting uglier. Here's persuasion. An ogre shows off his charm. The revamped rat pack is back. And Adam Sandler and Kevin James in marital bliss. New on DVD. And gay. We got the hottest new hotel on the strip. Okay then. George Clooney, Brad Pitt, and Matt Damon are back for Ocean's 13. New on DVD. Even though Banks stepped over the line, 
We have to do what's best for Reuben. Which means we offer Bank of Billy Martin. Wait a minute, and then what, he goes for it and that's it? He just gets off? That's the rule. No, that's the rules for someone who understands the rules, which Bank don't, because he already broke them. So he don't get the chance. This special feature includes deleted scenes not shown in theaters. That's not my job. Excuse me, sir, I'm not the janitor. Oh, no. Mike Myers gives parenting lessons on DVD with Shrek the Third. This special feature gives you an inside look at the animation of Shrek. Making an animated film requires a tremendous amount of technology, from the early story creation process through production all the way through to post-production. And our job as technologists is try to find and make the greatest and latest technology and bring that to the hands of the artist to enable the filmmakers to ultimately create their vision of the film. So, you've moved your relationship to the next level. How's it been going? Oh, great. We've just been having sex with each other all the time. And loads of sex. Gay, crazy sex. Man on man, loving every minute of it. Adam Sandler and Kevin James show a different kind of brotherly love in I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, new on DVD. I'd rather feel a, a flabby man peck, to be honest with you, but in the name of science, if you need me to hold your bodacious Bahama Mamas or whatever the guys call them nowadays, I'll do it. Yes, go ahead. Oh, like you. <laughs> I just got a little nauseous there. I'm usually laughing at This special feature takes you behind the lab. It's just silly. It's fun. Kevin makes it fun. Do you have a good time? Adam has this just amazing way of, he's just so full of life. And you can't help but get drawn to him and his energy. And it just makes everyone on set happy to be there. The American Film Institute celebrated its 21st annual film festival. Television pioneer Phil Donahue and Ellen Spiro showcased their new documentary, Body of War, a film that examines the politics of the Iraq War through the life of a wounded vet. When I made the phone call on September 13th, it was because I saw the pictures of him standing on top of the pile saying that we were going to smoke the evildoers out that did this to us and we were going to find them in their caves. This president scared the nation and took the whole country by the ear, right into the sword. And one of the victims, one of the really grievously injured victims of this bring em on macho West Texas sheriff mentality is highlighted in our film, Thomas Young, who uh, in Fort Hood during training wanted to know, why am I going to, F why am I going to Iraq? I want to go to Afghanistan. So he gets smart early, but he was in, he goes to a, Iraq, and in five days he gets shot. When you got shot, what was it like? I couldn't feel anything. I dropped my M16, I tried to pick it back up, but I couldn't move my hand. I hope kids across the, uh, the country who are thinking about the possibility of enlisting, whether it be for college money or for love of country, uh, both of which are very, uh, very good reasons to join. Uh, the ones who join for college money, I hope they can start a discussion around the coffee table. Mom, Dad, let's look into Pell Grants or Stafford loans. And the kids who uh, are willing, wanting to join for patriotic and for the love of country, I hope they can say, well, maybe we can wait to see who's elected in 2008 before we decide to do that. I'm sorry, but I just don't think Americans are seeing this pain. This president said you can't film the coffins coming home. And the entire mainstream media establishment said, okay, we haven't fought like press people should. We, we have a population that didn't stand up as it should. We have too many people who equate dissent with treason. I mean, sit down. This is America. Don't waste your right to speak. I speak for a man who gave for this 
The film's powerful message also attracted political activist and lead singer of Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder, who recently collaborated with Sean Penn on Into the Wild. I, I accidentally ran into Eddie. Eddie, Phil. I said, Eddie, I'm doing an anti-Iraq war film. And he said, didn't even blink. He said, you want a song? And I grabbed him. And he goes home to Seattle, calls Thomas, talks to him for a couple hours. And in four days, I had the no more of the, the anthem, the anti-war anthem, in an MP3 file in my email. Free. <laughs> I mean, what's an adult Disney World to you? Another AFI film, The Living Wake, showcased the talents of Mike O'Connell, an internet sensation with a gift for monologue. You gave me soup, sir. A warm blanket and a dictionary. And I haven't been able to shake you since. I love people who speak very uh, passionately and very deeply and dramatically. And uh, I've always been so amused by that. And I think that's, that was the impetus for the character. And just, uh, I don't know, people out of the norm and just acting strange has always been come quite easy to me. So uh, to elevate it to that level is not very difficult. <laughs> hey, you, man, what time is it? You have to buy a watch to get the time. I had all these jokes and about death that were not really going over very well, kind of in the uh, clubs, if you will. And I had all these monologues and all this weird stuff about failure and death, and so I didn't know what to do with it. So I decided to put it into kind of like a one-man show scenario. What is life if it is not uneasy? So, what are the various fire options? I'm sure you have standard cremation, but we were thinking something more along the lines of a funeral pyre in the town square. O'Connell's previous success on YouTube helped contribute to his financing of the film. I have a, a dear friend from a long time ago, Ken Jung, Dr. Ken, and we, uh, I decided to write some rap songs, and uh, he is my hook man. And we made this music video, put it on YouTube about a year ago, and now we've had like around a million hits and uh, it's kind of, we actually sold a movie pitch based on the video. Look at you now, my best friend, authorized biographer and poet extraordinaire. Yes, sir, in fact, I've often thought that if it wasn't for you, I would The road, ready. man, the road! That's all for this week's show. We'll see you next time on Stars, the Hollywood Reporter.